Excellent. Welcome everybody to the Metasploit Sprint demo meeting for November 14th, 2017. Let's hop in. So let's look at the pull, open pull request for over the last three months. So it's been fairly steady, steady static, yeah. kind of, you know, bumps around a little bit, but no huge spikes, you know, so that's, that's, that's cool. Keeping the hatches about it down. You know, I'm trying yeah. to, mm -hmm. you know, because there's definitely stuff coming in, um, you know, big shout out to all, all our community contributing members. Um, had a lot of good stuff coming in lately. Um, and there's the, uh, the leaderboard for anybody uh, keeping score at home. I'm at the top again. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Jeffrey's coming for you now. Yeah, I know. Dave, Dave just got so frustrated he quit the company altogether. <laughs> Jeffrey, Jeffrey, Jeffrey's coming for you now. Man. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, so talk about some things that we landed um, since the last time we spoke. Uh, we have Windows Local Privesk for uh, this particular CVE from Zero Steiner. Um, we've got some raw code execution exploit modules. Um, you can see the different, the, the, the good to break is like a, a video sort of managing software, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting because um, something is, we have one type, a different one, I think. Oh, maybe the, uh, oh, we'll see it in a minute. Now the Maco server, uh, the D-Link A50L router. Mm -hmm. um, we also have an IBM notes. If you remember, those of y'all remember Lotus notes, it's like what that became. Uh, client uh, denial of service that makes the client not usable. Um, one really cool thing we've got uh, Ruby directive support now in the interpreter RC scripts, so you can you can throw your Ruby in there and get it interpreted. Um, as always, very <laughs> <Or> interpreted, <laughs> interpreted, yes, yeah. as it were. Um, and as always, various fixes and improvements. Um, and we've also officially created the Metasploit for stable branch. Yeah, reference. and we've actually moved most of the build infrastructure to point to that now. Um, and that way we'll have, be able to open up the master branch for fun and amusement. Um, fun and amusement being five? Meaning Metasploit five yeah. development, right. Um, kind of another fun thing to sort of note about that D-Link 850L. Um, so back in the, let's say, late 90s, um, there was a company that was building their own MIPS clone, and they didn't use it the license code from the MIPS corporation themselves, or you know, the guys who own IP for it. And they got sued um, over four instructions for doing unlined memory reads. Wow. And uh, it just so happens that um, they just removed those instructions from the CPU. So you couldn't really call it a MIPS CPU. But this CPU, um, you know, basically the, the patent on these instructions expired in 2006. But in 2017, you can still buy routers that are missing these four instructions. Um, <laughs> and that's one of those is the D-Link 850L. Uh, and so due to a legacy of the late 90s, um, this router is still somewhat impaired. Um, and it's kind of interesting getting shellcode to work on this um, when you are missing those four instructions. We've actually built an entire new compiler to build uh, new payloads on this guy. And we're still <laughs> trying to struggling to get, get, get a full interpreter session to run on it. But um, it's a work in progress. It turns out the CPU is also in a lot of embedded IP cameras as well. Oh, wow. um, people just have the same chance all over the place. Basically, if you have a media tech, you've got this uh, kind of impaired CPU inside your device. And oh, people still sell it today, even though they could really just add the instructions back and no one to change the IP after that because the company is basically out of business. So, right, right. But people are still embedding the cores. So just a funny note about the Dura 850L is that there, there was a funny little historical um, aside, and we'll probably write a blog post about it later when we get it working. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's really funny. Uh, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> so, yeah. so true. Yeah. I thought of some things that we got uh, coming up on deck. Um, some more exploit modules, uh, if you like remote code. Um, we've got, there's a, a PR that we've been working on for, uh, another D-Link device. It's more of a NAS and, and a video recorder. There's oh, Kaltura, I think was the video software I was mm -hmm. thinking of. So we've got an exploit for that in the works. Uh, HP Load Runner um, and Explico, which is an NFAT, an open sourced NFAT, Network Forensics Analysis Tool. Oh, nice. So, yeah, that's, that's a fairly recent recent uh, PR, I think. We've got a slow, slow Loris uh, DOS module. That was kind of funny in that uh, the, the biggest challenge with the slow loss DOS module is not denial of servicing Metasploit itself. Uh, Matthew, Matthew Keenow has been working on that one and uh, making it not open too many sockets on itself and kill Metasploit is, is sort of the fun fun issue there. I was wondering what the, I saw that discussion, I was wondering what the, got it. Yeah. <laughs> previous one we've had, just improvements and not make our tails fall over. I think yeah, it's a, yeah. well, it's a, 
it's a new module itself. It is a new module. Yeah, but it is so it is the original slow Loris that is so starting. You may be thinking of S and D Loris, which was another module we had the same issue with um, not too long ago. Yes, that was um, that was a, 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 so this one is back on yeah. HTTP and not SMB, but it's the right. same concept. Open a connection, keep it open, make the other guy consume resources and put calls over. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. And then uh, we have one, I think you had actually PR'd up there, right? Rent for Outlook Web Access 2016 servers. That is correct. Support. Yeah. yeah, so that'll be nice. Metal extension loader PR is up. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Tim, who's been great and working, giving me bugs and other feedback. So I've, I've fixed a number of those and added some improvements along the way. So. Um, hopefully getting there. Um, printer exploits? Yeah, we, we bricked one printer and we we're, got we're on the second one. Yeah, so yeah. We'll, we'll have that one <laughs> up and running. Up and running. Uh, I think uh, the module mostly works because it writes some corrupt files, so we'll, we'll fix that and then we'll have some nice printer exploits. Uh, so getting there, yeah. yeah. Yep. And then, yeah, I just saw a check in this morning, I think. There was yeah, I got the, uh, the metal side point. of domain fronting working and uh, merged that. Uh, Tim Wright, thanks to him for, again, yeah. thanks to Tim. You know, he's, he's up in the middle of the night with your up, so you can talk to Tim. <laughs> and, wow. uh, and uh, well, it's not the middle of the night for him, no. but, <laughs> but he's there. But he's there. And uh, so we worked on that last night, and we'll get the other side working and get that in. Yeah, yeah that's awesome, man. Yeah. Some good things going on. Uh, let's hop into like the team update. The Dharma Initiative. Namaste. 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 Yeah. Namaste. Um, so a lot of the things that you saw in the things landed, uh, as far as modules go, were landed by the Dharma Initiative um, mm -hmm. and cleaned up and helping get through that whole process. Um, and also, I will de be demoing the uh, Soxify proxy I've been writing as part cool. of the uh, Coldstone project. And the Trevor Honoring Initiative, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. uh, in memory of Trevor. <laughs> Yes. Trevor Memorial. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Adam. Script kiddies. Anybody want to tell us about what y'all been up to? Or you just want me to read the slide? I'll just read the slide if I don't hear anything. I can't see my dialogue if somebody's typing stuff. You can see the script kiddies have been up to the omnibus builds. Payload testing and the, the, the multiplex MSF console terminal. Goodness. Yeah, and a lot of that that crazy Lexan. Um, was it Lexan? I forgot who made that CPU core, but a, a fair amount of the script kiddies have also been working on getting that that darn payload to work on that dirt 850 router. Oh, right on. Yeah. Um, also, one of the script kiddies is up at Sector <coughs> today giving a talk about Metaploid uh, up in Toronto. Yay! So shout Hi, out Jeffrey. to uh, Jeffrey. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Jeffrey. Nice. Good stuff. Abnormal form. Um, yeah, sorry, there's a wall of text there. Uh, we've been working on porting the HTTP client over to use net HTTP um, for simplicity of use and uh, increased performance. Um, it's looking pretty good. It's about 50% faster when doing just standard HTTP connections right now. When you're doing like large file transfers, which I don't feel like is a big use case, um, it's about the same, but uh, the, I think that's just data transfer. Um, not much you can do there. Um, Chris has been working on a, uh, a change in direction on the module cache improvements that he demoed last time. Um, uh, it sounds like he's got it. So uh, it's reducing the startup memory. There's no longer that like ten, eight to 10 second delay before you can start searching, uh, all without the database. And um, and it actually speeds up startup of the MSF console too. What? Um, and it uses less, it, it saves 100 megabytes from What's the I catch? Probably the just catch? deleted most of the modules and that's why it's faster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what makes Chris Atkins to delete it. Just get rid of those. Yeah. Yeah. He's just a hassle anyway. That is, that is, that is, that is that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure if he's going to demo it today. I don't think he is, but um, well, he said it would be boring, but that doesn't sound boring at all. Not sound boring at all. Yeah. Right. Um, and and Matthew's been working on uh, inventorying the work that we still have outstanding on converting things over to use the HTTP uh, data transfer service. Um, it turns out we are actually closer than we thought we were based on his findings. So wow. Okay. Wow, that's the kind of results I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> It's all on the up and up. Yeah, yeah. great job, abnormal form. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And now I guess follow that. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Flatlanders. Uh, yeah. That's, a, that's what Dev and I have been up to. Um, we Dev and I both did a little bit of content creation uh, this last cycle. Um, uh, Ruby SMB. Uh, you can see uh, some of the, the new coolness that's gone in there um, called out. Uh, like I mentioned, the metal extension uh, loader PR is is up and been getting love, so that's been a good thing. And we've also been on ticket triage this cycle for um, related to some of the commercial product stuff. 
exciting. And, and cool. I'm glad, glad the DCRPCC is working. I remember that was a yeah, yeah. tricky thing to get that final packet right. Yeah, yeah. It's time for demos. So we yeah. go. <laughs> this, uh, this is a firefighter showing you how not to fry your turkey this Thanksgiving next week. So, oh, my. It is. So, uh, so what I have right here is an exploit I demoed, I don't know, probably like six months ago. Um, it has the, wow, I typed the wrong command. It has the uh, notable uh, distinction of being the only Python exploit we currently have in tree. Uh, luckily, that session was all saved, making good use of the save command. Uh, so we can look at the options. There's nothing super weird about its configuration. Um, and we go, and we see it's all Python. Um, it's not super great code, but it's a lot cleaner than it was as a Metasploit module. Um, and it just uses the built-in Python SMTP lib to uh, exploit a Node.js uh, SMTP server. Uh, but one of the problems with the external modules when we introduced them was they couldn't really pivot or be proxied without you setting up your own proxy chains for, and it, yeah, the whole thing got messy. Um, and so what I've done is write a Sox5 server, uh, which is running in this tab, uh, which will use PySox as part of the uh, Metasploit uh, library abstraction. Uh, we can see we import module Metasploit from Metasploit import module, and then we do module.run. This will take care of hot patching all of the proxy settings for us using the PySox library. So basically, I can just use regular Python code. I don't have to do anything magical, and it will automatically go through the proxy. Yep. Anything that uses the uh, Python socket module. Mm -hmm. Socket has replaceable implementations inside of it. Okay. It's not terribly great practice necessarily, but it works. All right. So this is kind of like RecSocket, except you don't have to call it out explicitly, right? Right. Except you can, Python allows, uh, was designed to allow you to exchange uh, socket implementations instead of Ruby, where that would have been, we could have monkey patched it in, but it would have been quite a pain. All right. Cool. Um, and so we can just run the module. And we see we get the interpreter open, and in the tab with the uh, proxy debug output, we can see all of the SMTP uh, protocol messages going through. Oh, very nice. So that ran over the proxy. So that ran through the proxy. Um, unfortunately, I recently had problems getting the proxy to talk back to Metasploit and pivot over sessions. So this is not a pivoting demo yet, but all of the stuff is there in place. I just need to get all the pieces lined up. One thing that I was always curious about was why this module took so long to run i was worried it was like maybe it was the uh like the python external part nope it's because uh the module waits for the 450 plugin timeout uh, um, to verify that it triggered the bug um, and because the interpreter just stays open and it's a command injection uh, we can see that the name of the attachment it sent was should be visible in here. That file name is equal to Keyroy. Yeah. How can you not zip? Yeah. Oh, sorry. It, after you uh, unzip it, one of the file names is a uh, uh, a command injection. Okay. Cool. Uh, so this is actually really useful in other ways too. Like this so, is a yeah. way to debug what your module is doing. So yeah, I mean, PCAPs are of course always the truth. Uh -huh. But if you're going through like an SSL proxy upstream, so, then yeah. this will be able to proxy that and basically act as a man in the middle if you turn the debug on. Um, it will also be usable standalone from Metasploit. And so if you just need to have a Soxify proxy up, like if you wanted to proxy, say, Burp yeah. over a pivot, then you could do that. Right. Or you want to proxy chain Burp. Proxy chains and Burp do not get along super well. Um, so, if you want to point just burp at a single Sox5 proxy that was then proxy chain, this will be able to do that. Very nice. So, we'll be able to run burp across the session eventually. Right? Yep. Oh, that's so cool. I know a lot of people have been looking forward to that. Yep. I can tell this is written in Erlang. Yes, it is written in Erlang. This right. is the output from the uh, logger. Oh, who is that? Uh, what do you know? 
Erlang library. Very cool. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. when might people get a chance to play with this? Um, I'm polishing up the plugin version of this today. Okay. Um, and then as soon as I can get it in a somewhat distributable state, to where you don't have to spin up like a whole weird dev environment to get it running. Uh -huh. So later so this week. Automatic build. Yeah. Right. Cool. So a user would have to install Python, install uh, Erlang in their developing environment. Uh, well, the thing will, uh, sorry, the uh, module will pick up uh, any Python install that you've got. It requires a Python 2 version, mm -hmm. uh, but it's pretty smart about picking that up. Uh, and then in order to run the proxy, you will need Erlang. Yep. We should, we should think about adding that the, the Docker files bits to make that all this work. Yep. Get that added to the Docker file, et cetera. Nice. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. Very cool. All right, Mr. Brendan, you want to bring us bring us on home? Uh, I can certainly try. Awesome. All right. Oh, goodness. It even prompted me like I expected it to. Um, <laughs> oh. Okay, let me. See. Please tell me you see a, a Metasploit console. Yes, yes. That's, that's much better than showing my email. <laughs> <laughs> Get the right screen, you got it. We're good. Uh, so, the first thing that uh, I was going to demo is uh, Zero Steiner, who is one of our awesome contributors, put together uh, support for Ruby directives within resource scripts. Uh, so what that means is inside resource scripts, here's an example. In fact, it's the one I blatantly stole from him. Uh, I did throw a little bit of logic in to prove that you could do Ruby logic, but this resource script just runs sysinfo, get UID, then it falls into uh, a Ruby block. And then if the architecture is 64, it just prints out a quick little message um, and it also prints out the platform and the architecture uh, using the uh, using the classes and calls. So in theory, I have a nice domain controller running somewhere in this network. And the other thing that he did that was nice is he did tab complete. So when I hit tab, it's going to search through uh, a couple of different places that you would find a resource scripts. In this case, it's uh, back in the MS4 so it's not blown away whenever you uh, update or transition. This is just test.rc. And it runs this info. Uh, tells you uh, get user ID. In this case, it is 64 bit, so it prints out Arch 64 bit. And then the session platform and the session architecture. So this is really kind of cool because I've had uh, red team games where maybe I needed something that was infrequently used so that it might not have warranted something like a module. But this is something you can put together really quick to address some one-off maybe in a network that you're dealing with, uh, which would be really cool. Yeah. And I guess the, 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 the big difference between this and a interpreter script is that you um, start off in the interpreter context and then you can switch to Ruby if you want versus uh, you're already in Ruby and you have to sort of figure out how to get back into the, your interpreter session from that point. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's Very intuitive. Yeah. And I really enjoy this one because you, it, it honestly, the to be able to do this, to have it attached to the interpreter session rather than your framework session. It is kind of nice too. It means that you don't have to quite do the tap dancing to figure out which session you're attached to when you're working with, say, uh, uh, RC scripts. Right on. Very cool. That's right. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about really quickly was uh, for the automated testing, some of the uh, troubleshooting that's available. This is probably not going to take very long. Um, but mainly it's going to be just the artifacts that are generated. Um, this is actually a uh, the artifacts generated from another Zero Steiner PR, PR uh, 9041, um, that I used for testing. It provides a generic template here of uh, the target machine, the machine that launched the attack, 
the module it used, the payload it used, and I realize I probably have to slow down because I don't know what you guys are seeing. Um, it's, it's pretty responsive. Okay, and uh, this shows all tests passed. Uh, one of the things you can do is you can click on session content and it actually takes you to the session that was generated. So you can go through and see where everything went south, if it did go south. Right. Um, the other thing you can do is, as Adam said, PCAPs don't lie. So let's say, for example, this failed. If you come up here, here's a PCAP from that host. And so here you have the PCAP that will not lie. In this case, we use port 3001. You have that conversation that takes place between the two sections, which has been really useful when I've been trying to troubleshoot what's been going on. And the other advantage to this is if there is a module that somebody wants PCAPs for, for every single uh, VM that they have to see what's going on, because maybe they want to troubleshoot it, you can produce that pretty quickly. Um, tons of artifacts get generated. Uh, the scripts that are run, so in this case, one of the things that makes this useful for reusing, I don't even know if you can read this, but this is the entire bash script that's created to generate the payload and the RC script. So one of the things that's gonna be nice is hopefully when I tag team with some other groups, we can just create this, dump it onto a VM, and send it off to the ether somewhere. And when it boots up, it'll just start launching the, uh, the script. Sorry. Any questions? I will say it looks really cool. <laughs> and then, uh, I guess for a, for a practical example, uh, I don't know if you guys remember Egypt the other day was asking in uh, IRC if anybody knew if Windows 2K3 still worked with Meterpreter. And as soon as I got that message, uh, in about 15 minutes, I put together the test session and lo and behold, yes. <laughs> 0867 will absolutely work with reverse TCP. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's really all I had. Very cool. Nice. Excellent.